I'm Deborah Blum, and thank you for joining us for the debut of ILTV's weekly program, One on One with Professor Dershowitz. We want to give you, our viewers, the chance to have your pressing question answered by one of America's greatest legal minds, a leading expert on criminal and constitutional law, civil liberties, as well as the Arab-Israeli conflict, just to name a few. Welcome, Professor Dershowitz. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be on this wonderful channel and to answer your hard questions. Everyone, from public figures to students throughout the world, want your insight. For our first program, we're joined today by a very special guest, Knesset member and Israel's Minister of Internal Security, Strategic Affairs, and Hasbara, Gilad Erdan. Let's hear from him. Professor Delschwitz, shalom. Congratulations on your new program on ILTV. Ellen, you have been on the front lines for over 50 years, fighting without fear on behalf of Israel and the Jewish people, and for all people, everyone who seeks justice and truth. When we met in May, you impressed me with your energy and passion. You care about Israel and stand up to those who want to delegitimize us. But your passion is not limited to your people. You clearly see the danger to all democratic societies that comes when people corrupt ideas, misuse the law, and make false claims about human rights to promote human wrongs. When you published the case for Israel almost 15 years ago, you were ahead of your time. Like all great teachers, you used questions and answers to make complex issues easier to understand. With your new program, you are once again ahead of your time. People today are busier than ever. You give them the information they need. I'd like to kick off your program by asking the first question. Alan, what is the toughest question about Israel that you have been asked over the last half century? I'm looking forward to hearing your answer. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Erdogan, and thank you for the important work you do protecting Israel's security and for the important work you do presenting Israel's case in the International Court of, um, of Public Affairs. So the question I think that's the hardest that I've been asked over the years is, if Israel's case is so strong and if Israel is justified in what it's doing and if Israel has the right to exist and thrive as the nation state of the Jewish people, why are so many good and decent people around the world so virulently anti-Israel? Uh, the people who are anti-Israel aren't limited to the usual suspects, the neo-Nazis, the Holocaust deniers, uh, people on the extreme hard left, communists, etc., Stalinists. There are decent people, uh, center left people particularly, who feel strongly against Israel. How do you explain that? I think that's the hardest question that I'm asked, particularly on university campuses. And let me try um, to respond. Um, it's probably uniquely in the nature of being Jewish that we are often uh, in the minority. Often we stand alone. All one has to do is look back at Jewish history and remember we were accused of uh, killing uh, Jesus. We were accused of poisoning the wells. We were accused of bringing the Black Plague. We were accused of so many, so many things that we didn't do. The blood libels not only have been common throughout Jewish history, but have been believed by a majority of people, including a majority of decent people. You know, there used to be an ad on television in America. I don't know if it ever ran in Israel. It was an anti-drug ad, and it showed a scrambled egg uh, in the frying pan. And then it showed the egg being mushed up. Uh, and the yoke being destroyed, and the, the line was, this is your brain, and then when it gets scrambled, this is your brain on drugs. I've often thought about that because smart people and decent people have good brains, but when it comes to talking about Israel and the nation state of the Jewish people, their brains get scrambled. They just don't think rationally. They believe uh, arguments that are totally untrue on their face. Uh, they disbelieve empirical evidence, like Groucho Marx once said, uh, who, should I, who should you believe, me or your lying eyes? Um, the, the evidence is so clear. Take, for example, the fact that Israel offered essentially a two-state solution back when the Balfour Declaration was enacted 
1947 and 1948, 1967, 1990, 1991, 2000, 2001, most recently 2008. And the uh, Arabs and Palestinians and Muslims in, in 67 went to Khartoum and issued their three famous no's, no negotiation, no peace, no recognition. And since that time, no Palestinian leader has been prepared to accept generous peace offers from the Palestinians. People just don't know that. And if they hear it, they just don't believe it. And so I think it's very important to recall the historical perspective and remember that we have been right over history, even though we have been disbelieved. We have been right when everybody else has been wrong. And so never, ever let the majority opinion, never let your peers, even if they're decent people, dissuade you from support for Israel. Uh, we have MF, truth, on our side. We have history. We have the facts. And we must continue to put these facts out there in the court of public opinion without regard to how many people disagree with us. So that's the answer to that, I think, very hard question. Thank you, Professor. Now, turning to our viewers' questions. The first asked by Benji Simai from Melbourne, Australia. Hi, my name is Benji Simai from Melbourne, Australia. My question for Professor Dershowitz is, assuming a two-state solution does not eventuate, what are the other options, slash, what is likely to occur? Benji, thank you so much for your hard question from down under. What a beautiful country. I've spent a lot of nice times in Melbourne, including going to a Seder uh, there some years ago. Look, there are two questions, and that is one, a factual one. What will happen if a two-state solution is not adopted? And the second is what should happen. Uh, I don't think there really is an alternative to some form of a two-state resolution. Okay. Israel as a democracy simply cannot continue forever to both uh, occupy disputed territory in the West Bank and deny the citizens of the West Bank the right to full participation in, in government. Uh, that's not tenable. Uh, on the other hand, we saw what happened when Israel gave uh, complete autonomy to the Palestinians in, in Gaza. They could have built themselves uh, Singapore on the Mediterranean. They could have had the most beautiful area in the Middle East. And they got fortunes of money to help build, including Israel leaving behind some of the uh, greenhouses and other farm equipment. And they turned it all into rockets and tunnels for terrorism. So one cannot be completely optimistic about what would happen if the Palestinians on the West Bank got their own state. But the alternatives are, are very dire. Um, and they are continued occupation. They're creating a one-state solution, which ultimately would result in Israel becoming uh, Palestine, yet another Arab uh, Muslim state because of the demographic realities, it may take time. Um, the third possibility is an undemocratic one, which I don't think any of us could accept, uh, having a double standard for uh, those who are, quote, real Israelis and those who live in uh, uh, territories. So I really do think that we have to put all of our efforts into coming up with the possibility of a two-state solution, but a two-state solution that first and foremost secures uh, Israel's security and doesn't allow a Palestinian state to become a launching pad for rockets, terrorism, or even worse, as has happened in the Gaza. So a Palestinian state must A, be demilitarized, uh, B, it has to have changed borders that uh, secure Israel's uh, right to protect itself. Third, it probably has to have the presence of some Israeli military for at least a period of time until one can be absolutely certain that there will not be a renewed fighting. Remember that when the United States occupied Germany and Japan after the Second World War, they didn't leave immediately. Uh, and indeed, there was no real belligerence. Japan had surrendered. Germany had surrendered. Uh, they had given up. And nonetheless, the armies remain there until it was absolutely certain that there'd be no renewed fighting. Under international law, a country has the right to a military occupation until there is an end of hostilities. But from a political point of view, a moral point of view, a legal point of view, the two-state solution in one form or another is the only viable alternative for Israel. 
Uh, one might argue the Palestinians don't deserve their own state. They certainly don't deserve it more than the Kurds or the Tibetans. They have employed violence. They have turned down an opportunity to have two states for so long. But whether or not the Palestinians deserve a state of their own, Israel deserves not to have to control um, uh, uh, millions of people on the West Bank. Uh, how to deal with the current uh, settlement areas? That's complex. I mean, most of the two-state solution ideas do involve Israel maintaining control over the large settlement blocks in exchange for uh, ceding some land in other areas. These are all important details. The devils are in the details. But if there's a will to a two-state solution, there will be a way, to paraphrase Herzl, if you dream it and if you will it, uh, it can happen. And so I'm a strong supporter of some form of a two-state solution with the complete guarantees of Israel security. Thank you for that, Professor. Next, you'll hear from Noam Gressel from Connecticut in the U.S. Greetings from Israel. Professor Dershowitz, I'm Noam Gressel from Greenwich, Connecticut. And my question to you is as follows. With the onset of the radical Islamic terror wave against France, do you think the moral clarity required to look past BDS's anti-Israel narrative be more or less forthcoming among the French? If so, or if not, why? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Noam. I spent three wonderful years in Connecticut, Yale Law School, and have a lot of friends in, in Greenwich. So it's, it's nice to talk to you, and it's nice to know that you're spending some time uh, in Israel now. Uh, Look, I don't know whether the French will learn. Uh, I don't wish them harm. Uh, I, I hope terrorism can be stopped in France. But the amazing thing about the anti-Israel fanatical mind is it can turn every fact into an anti-Israel fact. Take, for example, of terrorism, which you've discussed. Uh, there's a man in America who's the head of uh, an organization called Black Lawyers for Justice, an organization that provides legal services against police violence. Uh, you'd think that would be a decent organization, but its leader has said that, uh, you know, it was the Jews who caused 9-11. It was the Jews who killed Martin Luther King. Of course, he also says it was the Jews who killed Jesus. And, and he's a man who has been embraced by uh, some prominent people, even Cornell West and others. Uh, so you never know how events will affect people's views. If people are fanatically opposed to Israel, they will fit all of the events into their anti-Israel narrative. If they're supportive of Israel, they'll fit the events into a pro-Israel narrative. The target always has to be the people in the middle, the people who have open minds, the people who are prepared to listen to all sides of an argument. And one would think that the increasing radical Islamic jihadist terrorism, not only in France, but in Germany and Belgium and so many other parts of the world, and of course in our own country, uh, the United States, would make people far more sympathetic to what Israel faces and far more cautious about encouraging uh, Arab Springs uh, all over the Middle East. Uh, we've seen that the Arab Spring has turned into a cold terrorist winter in, in Libya and uh, in other places, and it's turned into some degree of repression uh, in Egypt uh, following uh, Islamic control. And we worry about what's going on in Turkey today, one of the most powerful armies in the world, a member of NATO, and an erstwhile ally of Israel now perhaps returning to that status in a limited capacity. So what's going on in the world should make people much more supportive of Israel. We live in an unstable world. The only stability in the Middle East comes from Israel. It's the only democracy, including Turkey now, which has turned into a tyranny. It's the only reliable ally of the United States. So you would think that what's going on in the world would make Israel's position in the court of public opinion more secure, but it's in the nature of things that people put facts into whatever narrative they have previously believed. So we have a struggle ahead of us. Following up on the current wave of terror, here's what Kiana Sanchez from San Francisco, California wants to know. Hi, Professor Dershowitz. My name is Kiana Sanchez. Now, with all the recent terror attacks happening here on U.S. soil, several groups are calling for a ban on Muslims entering the U.S. Is there any chance that this ban can actually pass on a federal or state level? Kiana, thank you for your uh, excellent, excellent question from beautiful uh, San Francisco. 
Uh, first of all, let me be very clear that no state can exclude anybody. Under the Constitution, only the federal government controls borders. Uh, everybody can cross over from one state to another. So once a person is allowed into the United States, they have complete, complete freedom of movement between and among the states. That is true to some degree in Europe today, and that's caused a lot of problems and may have contributed to the Brexit vote in England because many European countries want to close their borders to what they believe might be Islamic extremists who are coming into the country to do harm. On the federal level, it would be impossible, I believe, to ban any group of people based on their religion. Now, it was done in the past. Uh, Jews were banned. Uh, we all know that between the time my grandparents came to America in the late uh, 1800s and the early 1900s and the uh, end of the Second World War, there was essentially a prohibition on Jews coming into America, which is why so many Jews were trapped in Europe and murdered in the Holocaust. So the law on immigration is not completely clear, but the Constitution does provide that no religious tests shall be uh, allowed. Now, it's in the context of holding office, but I believe even the current Supreme Court, now divided four to four, who knows what it will be like in um, months and years to come, would not allow a ban based on religion. Now, if the opponents of Islamic immigration were smart about it, they would impose the ban based on national origin, on countries from which the people come. That, those kinds of bans have been sustained in the past. Um, I would strongly oppose, myself, any ban which is based on generalities. One of the reasons, among many, that I oppose the BDS movement is it discriminates based on national origin. Anybody who's an Israeli, in fact, BDS only discriminates against Israeli Jews, but all Israeli Jews, no matter what their positions are on the peace process, uh, on the Arab-Israeli conflict, are subject to the boycott, divestment, sanctions. And so I would oppose any restrictions that were based on group identity rather than individual characteristics. Moving on to a very hot topic, the election. Frederick Sebring from Florida asks you the following. Hello, my name is Frederick Blum and I'm from Sebring, Florida. My question is this, who should we vote for in November? bearing in mind security of Israel. Frederick, uh, thank you so much. And you asking the question is very important because you're from Florida. Uh, I also uh, live in Florida. And our votes may determine who is the next president of the United States. And we all remember 2000. I was one of the lawyers in Bush versus Gore for uh, Al Gore. And uh, remember that that national election was decided by a few hundred votes in Florida hanging chads, Jews who mistakenly voted for Pat Buchanan. Uh, we all remember it very well and want to make sure that nothing like that ever happens again in terms of just distorting the electoral process. I'm actually in the process of writing a book about that right now that will be out in time for the election. Uh, from Israel's point of view, the most important result of the election is that Israel continue to be regarded as bipartisan and that there be continued bipartisan support for Israel. Um, look, there's no doubt that today Republicans in general tend to be more supportive of Israel than Democrats. Uh, that's part of the reason I remain a Democrat. I have to fight the fight within the Democratic Party to keep uh, Israel's security uh, high on the agenda of the Democratic Party. And it's a hard fight because there are young people in the Democratic Party who hate Israel. Uh, the Democratic Party is being more influenced by organizations like Move On, Code Pink, Black Lives Matter, and others which are virulently uh, anti-Israel. The Sanders campaign brought out a lot of anti-Israel uh, rhetoric. Sanders, to his everlasting disgrace, appointed a, a, a man uh, to his, uh, his platform committee, Cornell West, who has embraced uh, anti-Semites and people who've called for genocide against, quote, Jewish babies and Jewish old ladies. Uh, and Cornel West, who was appointed by Sanders to membership on the platform committee, uh, called this despicable bigot uh, a dear brother, embraced him, and called for crowds to support him. So I'm very worried about what's going on with the Democratic Party. I am not worried about Hillary Clinton herself. I've known her for many, many years. 
She has strong feelings, um, positive about Israel. She supports the two-state solution. She has questions, as many Americans do, about Israel's uh, settlement policies. Um, and uh, but she supports a vigorous uh, Israel defense, uh, qualitative military superiority, and Israel's ability to defend itself against rocket and terrorist attacks. I personally will vote for uh, Hillary Clinton. Um, she is predictable. Um, she is stable. Um, I don't really know where Donald Trump stands on many of these uh, issues. He has promised to be supportive of Israel, but he also called on a more balanced approach so that he could negotiate a peace. But I repeat, I'm not telling people on this program who to vote for. That's not the purpose of these questions and answers. I am saying that the most crucial thing is to keep support for Israel, a bipartisan issue. We never want to have happen in America what has happened in Europe, where left-wing parties don't support Israel and right-wing parties are more supportive. We always want to see both the Democrats and the Republicans completely supportive of Israel. That is the case in this election. Both candidates are strongly supportive of Israel. It may not be the case in future elections. That's why I will remain a Democrat and work very, very hard within the Democratic Party to assure that the Democratic Party maintains its strong support for Israel. What are your thoughts on the flag burning that occurred just outside of the Democratic National Convention yesterday? One person. You know, you can't generalize about that. Of uh, course. And it had nothing to do with Hillary Clinton herself. It just was a shock to see. Mm -hmm. And there were also anti-Israel uh, uh, protests outside the Republican Convention. Yeah. Uh, there was about before by this guy named Shabazz of, of Black uh, Lawyers for Justice. Uh, he spoke in front, not at, but outside uh, at an event in Cleveland at the time of the Republican convention. So don't judge parties by the people who are outside the conventions. Judge them by their candidates. Now, I have to tell you that there are more people in the Democratic convention that will boo when Israel is mentioned or fail to support Israel than within the Republican Party. And that's why we have to work hard to keep the issue bipartisan. Well, we'll have to see what finds out. And now for our last question, from my friend, Chloe Valdry, a Robert L. Bartley Fellow at the Wall Street Journal, based in New York. Hi, Professor Dershowitz. What would you say are some of the steps the community needs to take when it comes to engaging a new generation? my generation, and talking about Israel in a much more dynamic, proactive way. Well, first of all, Chloe, you are the voice of the future. Uh, I have to tell you, I admire you no end. You have stood up against anti-Israel bigotry at your university and in many places around the world, and you have risked your popularity and perhaps even your physical safety in standing for principle. Uh, and so congratulations. When I see you, I become much more optimistic about the future. And your question is a, a brilliant question, typical of you. Uh, and that is, how do we address the younger generation? And there's no question that the younger generation tends to be less supportive of Israel because they do not include in their memory bank when Israel was attacked in 1948, 1967, 1973. Um, their memories are quite short. What they think about is the occupation, the settlements, etc. The first thing I would do is bring as many people as possible to Israel. It has a transforming effect on them. And people are surprised when I tell them that the first place I would bring visitors who are open-minded and don't have a strong point of view, the first place I would bring them in Israel is to Ramallah, Ramallah on the West Bank, because many people think that the occupation has caused uh, all of the West Bank to look like the worst parts of the Gaza Strip. And you go to Ramallah and you see a thriving city with nice cars and shops that sell electronics and wonderful restaurants and beautiful white Jerusalem stone uh, buildings. And people are shocked and they say, this is the occupation? We've never seen this before. We've been misled. We've been fooled by so many people. And then, of course, you have to take them throughout Israel and see what this thriving democracy has produced. You have to persuade young people to look at what Israel has done for them today, how it has saved the lives of their parents through and grandparents through medical technology, as how it has helped the environment 
through drip agricultural technology, how it has uh, helped foster uh, the internet, how it has tried to uh, make peace. And we need young people like you, Chloe, out there sending that message. Uh, you know, I'm um, 70, almost 78 years old. I will continue to try to make the case for Israel as long as God gives me the strength to make the case. And the other point I would make, Chloe, is don't try to defend or justify everything Israel does if you personally don't agree with it. Uh, you have to be honest and credible in your defense of Israel. I make what I call the 80% case. I am personally critical of some of the settlement policies of Israel. I am critical of the way women are uh, treated by uh, the uh, Orthodox establishment in Israel in relation to prayer at the Kotel and other places. And I'm willing to express my criticism, uh, but uh, I support Israel's right to thrive as the nation state of the Jewish people and to defend itself. So honesty and integrity in making the case for Israel is absolutely essential. Getting young people to help make the case for Israel and telling the truth, the truth, making young people understand the history. Young people don't love history. They want to know what's happening now, today, tomorrow. But a little bit of history is absolutely essential to understanding the issues of the Middle East. Uh, as uh, a great philosopher put it, those who fail to understand history are doomed to repeat it. And Israel and the Jewish people cannot afford to repeat much of the history it has experienced. So, Chloe, may you go from strength to strength. And you know I'm always there for you. If you need support from the older generation, I'm there to help you. But you have to, you know the younger generation better than any of us do. And you have to come up with ways to tell the truth to people who are going to be our future. So thank you so much, Chloe. Thank you, Professor. That's all the time we have for your questions today. I also want to thank all of our guests, especially Minister Erdan. If you'd like Professor Dershowitz to answer your questions as well, go to ILTV.TV or our Facebook page and submit them. We can't wait until you'll join us again next week. Thank you again, Professor. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. The pleasure was mine.